The Climate Show is brought to you by hottopic.co.nz and Kiwi FM. Hello and welcome along to The Climate Show. My name is Glenn Williams and this is the show uh, where we look at some of the current issues around climate change, the causes, the effects, the sceptics and the solutions as well. We mix it all up in this audio half hour or video half hour depending on how you're um, viewing or, or listening to this but none of this would be possible without my co-host and climate enthusiast Gareth Rinaldin from hottopic.co.nz. Hello to you Gareth. Hello, Glenn. How are you? Good, good. Um, I hope you don't mind. We've audaciously, I suppose, boldly called this show uh, The Climate Show. I did, I did a very brief Google, and I couldn't find anything else out there that was called that, so I thought, heck, why not? Why, why don't we do that? Yeah, well, you might, it covers all the bases, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Well, um, so this is so so this is the the first show. We're call, we're 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 putting it in beta. It's not necessarily episode one, but I thought this would be something that we should um we should try and put out there and and perhaps get some feedback at the end of it. Um, and and let, let, people can let us know their thoughts on what we what we've been talking about and um perhaps some suggestions for um for future episodes as well. Uh, so so our apologies if it's a bit all over the place, but we're just finding our feet, Gareth. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think it's really important that we do get lots of feedback. The more emails we get, the more questions that we get asked, um, the more we can make the content relevant to our listeners and viewers. And we, we, we hope that we'll be able to, um, apart from covering kind of climate news as it happens, also talk to some of the key people who are involved in the climate business, uh, whether we're talking to scientists or uh, people who are looking for solutions. Um, or even just people like me who who have become interested in the subject over the years and have learned a bit and perhaps can say a bit more than cautious scientists might. But uh, yeah. yeah, so the, the more feedback, the better, basically. I'd, I've just actually looked in my Twitter stream and um, there's another Gareth who happens to be a Green MP and he um, tw tweeted a, a, few, a few minutes ago that... Um, we were actually facing a climate emergency, mm. and I and I think that yeah, it's that really is what we're facing. You know, it, we're doing things now that are irreversibly changing the face of the planet. And I got involved in all of this because you know my kids and and their kids are going to have to live, and I, I live in a planet that's different to the one that I grew up in. And, and I would very much like them to be able to enjoy the same sorts of things that I've enjoyed over my lifetime. So it's a real emergency, but un unfortunately, on on human time scales, you know, from one month to the next, from one year to the next, it's not necessarily. It's, you know, it's, it's not like a train wreck where you no. see the train coming. It's a slow train wreck, if you can imagine that. <laughs> it's kind of like it's kind of like the Austin Powers, I think, scene where uh, the forklift is heading for him, but it's going at an extremely slow pace, and he's yelling at ah, but he's not moving. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. But, you know, to take the other perspective, which is a perspective that often skeptics like to use, um, in geological timescales, the, the, the pace of change that's happening now, you know, in a couple of million years' time, when, when the cockroaches are ruling the planet, they may find this sort of thin black layer um, in, in the sediments deposited around our time, and they will think that this was you know, the equivalent of the meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs. Mm. The thing that we're, we're making such big changes to the, to the planetary system Indeed, indeed, and and something yeah. I, I do want to um, I do want to mention before we go on is that um, is that you're joining us from um, your homestead in North Canterbury, and you're a truffle farmer. Is that right? I am indeed. Yes, in fact, yeah, we we grow um, uh, trees that are infected with a fungus that produces truffles, which are a very expensive food item. So they they uh, I love the flavour of them, but I also like the fact that restaurants will pay three dollars a gram for them. Okay, well, how this show, uh, show is going to roll is um, uh, we're going to run through some some current news and some um, current issues over the past. Uh, week or two, and then we're going to have a, um, a feature interview. Um, today we're going to bring in Kevin uh, Cudby, who is the author of From Smoke to Mirrors, How New Zealand Can Replace Fossil 
liquid fuels with locally made renewable energy by 2040. Um, and uh, it's, it's one of those things I've often, I've, I've often pondered. What if the oil supply was cut off or at least squeezed in, in the next um, year or tomorrow or whatever? You know, what would we do? How would we, how would we manage? So um, that's going to be really interesting. And then we're going to talk about um, skeptics. We're going to dive into that area of all this as well, but a bit of controversy. And also um, the solutions and one possible solution. We're looking at um, at PV cells. There's been some innovation in PV cells uh, and some research around turning roads into PV cells or gaining energy from roads and the fact that roads are um, are everywhere and they're flat and they face the sky and they face the sun. So why not use them um, to a better effect than driving cars on them? So, um, Gareth, we should, um, we should dive into some of the news... Of, um, of this week. Um, first of all, um, I mean, this stuff is coming out all the time, I suppose, but there's been another um, mad statistic about a, a country setting a new extreme heat record. Yes, absolutely. It's now, I think, 18 countries this year. Um, Pakistan earlier, uh, before the monsoon flooding there, set a, a, a new national record of 128.3 degrees Fahrenheit, which I think is well, 44 degrees Celsius, something like that. And I know that when it gets to um, 34 degrees Celsius on my little farm in Wipera, um, I go and sort of sit in the shade and yeah. cling to a, a glass of cold wine or water. And God only knows what that must have been like in Pakistan. But, yeah. Uh, then you've, we had the Russian heat wave, um, which was uh, quite literally unprecedented in that part of the world, setting all-time records. And then we've got Zambia. Um, coming in with an all-time record of 42.4 degrees Celsius, which is 108.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. Uh, and that was on October the 13th, last Wednesday, um, in a town called Mufue. Now, I hope I, I pronounced that properly. Um, the previous record was 42.3, which was set in 2005. So, And it's a year where the um, the global temperature has been setting new records um, mm. and I think you were going to uh, we're going to go and look at the the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's statement that released on the 15th of the month that the year-to-date global temperature ties for the warmest in the record okay uh, so uh, I think NASA and their GISS uh, temperature the gist temp series they reckoned that um, the 12 months, I think, to July was the warmest ever. Uh, so, you know, we're, on, we're setting records all the time. And if you look at the, the picture on the screen that you can see at the moment, there's on the right-hand side, there's a little map of the temperature anomalies for September. And the big red dots, the, the bigger they are, the, the hotter it is. Mm. So you can see some blue. There's a bit of blue over the Pacific because we've moved into an El Nino. So the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific are a bit cooler. Uh, interesting with El, with a La Nina happening. Um, uh, basically, the, the the big red dots are out are outweighing all the blue ones. And there is a reasonable chance that 2010 will be the warmest year ever recorded. Um, well, let's put it this way: to be to be pedantic, the warmest year since records began, which is you could usually say it's 150, 160 years. Okay, and and it's often um, when there is a, a really cold winter, people will come out and say, "Oh, what's all, what's this global warming business?" Um, you know, we've we've had the the harshest winter on record, or something like that. So, um, how does that fit into the pattern of this? Well, it's interesting that that certainly happened last Northern Hemisphere winter because the east coast of the U.S. had uh, a very cold winter. It was very snowy. Um, and Europe, uh, Britain and France, Holland and so on, had an exceptionally cold. Um, it was the coldest for 35 years, I think, hmm. in January and February. And that did lead a lot of people to say, well, where's the global warming gone? But when you came and looked at the NOAA numbers or the NASA numbers for the whole planet, we found that the winter overall in the Northern Hemisphere wasn't a cold winter. It wasn't a particularly warm one, but, you know, it wasn't uh, extremely cold everywhere. And, and so you've got to distinguish between what's happening on average around the world 
and individual weather events because individual weather events can be much hotter or much colder than than the global average yeah so for instance um here's an example that that will, is relevant to something we're, we're going to talk about a bit later on but if you can imagine that the world uh, is aiming for a target of warming no more than two degrees celsius well that's two degrees celsius on the global average but that two degrees celsius means that the arctic for instance may well be warming five to seven degrees celsius so you get a lot more warming in the arctic but it gets kind of brought the on the global average it gets brought back down to to two degree average okay the other thing that's interesting about cold winters is that they are a product just like the russian heat wave of a particular weather pattern and one of the things that i'm suspicious of at the moment is that some of the changes that we're seeing in the northern hemisphere and in particular in the arctic are affecting those weather patterns so they're making things like the russian heat wave like those cold winters um in in parts of the northern hemisphere um a bit more likely than they might have been 10 years ago so there's a bit of a paradox that um global warming and what it's doing to the weather system might actually mean cooler weather for one or two places or snowier winters I really like um, this term. I, I read this somewhere the other day um, that, that the Arctic sea ice is like the canary in the global warming coal mine. Well, I think that's quite a cool way to describe it. Yeah, absolutely, because it's actually very visible. That you can. There's a wonderful website that um, NASA do. They they have what they call their MODIS Rapid Response website, and I'm sure we can provide a link for this at some point. But the they have a thing called the Arctic Mosaic, and a picture that they put together every day based on the orbits being made by their Terra and Aqua satellites. And, and it's basically a, a, a photorealistic picture of the pole. Hmm. Um, so you can look down on the Arctic every day and see what's happening. You can watch individual icebergs moving um, between Greenland and Baffin Island, for instance. Earlier this year, a great big chunk um, several Manhattans in size uh, broke off the Peterman Glacier and using the Arctic Mosaic you could watch this big chunk of ice disappearing down um, in, uh, to, into the uh, kind of warmer ocean to the south. So those things, it is a really visible thing and you, there are a, quite a few people who um, actually look at these pictures daily to try and work out what's happening uh, in the Arctic. So, yeah, it's very visible and it's quite dramatic too because, you know, 20 years ago, um, it wouldn't have been possible to do this this summer, for instance. A Russian sailing vessel and a Norwegian sailing catamaran both circumnavigated the northern hemisphere around the Arctic. So the Norwegian boat left Bergen in Norway um, sailed up around over the top of Siberia, squeezing through the, the northeast passage. Um, then it sailed across to Alaska and went through the islands to the north of Canada, oh. the Canadian archipelago, the northwest passage, and then sailed across the Atlantic to get back to Norway. In fact, they're arriving in Bergen on Thursday. They actually um, are getting there ahead of schedule. Um, sorry, Oslo, they're going. Uh, um, but they're arriving there a day or so ahead of schedule, so they're having to park up for the night to wait to get in to meet the people welcoming them. But, I mean, it was, you go back, the first circumnavigation by a sailing vessel was made, I think in a, uh, forgive me if I've got the date wrong, but it was about 2003, something like that. And it took them two years to do it. And now we have two sailing boats managing to do it in a single season. Yeah. And that tells you something about the pace of change. Yeah, and let's um, let's continue to talk about Arctic sea ice. Um, you've uh, written a post on Hot Topic. Yeah, I, what I started out by doing was um, we, when we were talking when we were talking just then about looking down on the Arctic from space, you can see what what area of ocean the ice is covering, but you can't tell how thick that ice is, and so the information that we have on ice thickness is really quite limited. Um, NASA used to have a satellite called um, ISAT that gave us some information and the Europeans have just flown a satellite called Cryosat 2 which will give us much better and more detailed information and it's gathering its, its first data products being released now so hopefully over the next year we'll learn more. 
system developed by the University of Washington. It's called PioMass, and it's basically a, a sea ice model into which they fit the data that we do have. So they have information from buoys and so on. Mm. And that, and if you're looking at the graph on that page now, the, the that gives you a volume for the ice. And so the blue line at the top there is the volume of ice in September over the last 21 years. The green line is the area of the ice. So in fact, it's the extent, which is, I won't bother you with the definition, but, um, and that's the extent uh, measured from space. And what we can see is that the green line is dropping a bit. You know, the line at the bottom is how thick the ice is at the end uh, at that September minimum. Now, what I then did was I looked at the rate of the uh, loss of the volume and the rate of the extent and tried projecting them into um, into the future. Now, if we look at the rate that the ice has been dropping over the last 20 years and project it forward, keep going, Glenn, you're you're on the red line there. Here <laughs> yeah. we go. That's the one. If that's the blue line there is the volume decline and the green line is what happens to the extent and it dips below a million when you get to 2020. Hmm. And that, that's if the ice melts as fast as it has done on average over the last 21 years. Now, I then took the rate of um actually if you look at that graph you'll see that the blue line is noticeably less steep than the the first 10 years at the on the left hand side yeah so what i did for the next effort was to basically take the last 10 years and say that the next 10 years are going to be the same so if you go down to the next graph we find that the arctic effectively um, becomes ice free in 2016 so five more seasons and we'll see the end of the summer sea ice it'll be possible to sail from uh, Europe to Japan across the North Pole in September, perhaps as early as 2016. So what the volume data is telling us is that the ice has got somewhere between five and ten years before it disappears in summer. Hmm. So in 40 years time, uh, it's predicted that there will be no ice all year round at all. Well, that's my prediction. Um, based on the rate at which we're losing the ice at the moment. As I said, it's 740 cubic kilometres of ice um, a year currently over the last 10 years that's been disappearing. And when you look at the amount of new ice that's made by the winter cooling in the Arctic, which is around somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 cubic kilometres of ice a year, um, divide that by 740 cubic kilometers and it comes out to something like uh, 40 odd years. So by the early 2040s, uh, we could be in a position where we don't just have uh, an Arctic Ocean that you can sail across in summer, but you have an Arctic Ocean you can sail across in winter. And the reason that this concerns me greatly, obviously, because it's a huge change in the um, in the climate of, of the Northern Hemisphere and of the planet as a whole. Mm. But we do know that it has happened in the past. There have been periods in the past when warming has led to the loss of the ice in the north. And during the uh, what's called the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum 58.5 million years ago, there was a, a spell in the Arctic when sea surface temperatures are estimated to have got up to 24 degrees Celsius. You know, it's a bit like swimming in in Golden Bay. <laughs> yeah, and they, there were crocodiles and palm trees and things around the Arctic. So we know that it's possible that the Arctic can get that warm. Um, what what is speculative is how quickly it could happen. I was really surprised when I just did my I called it a a back of the back of the envelope calculation because I just wanted to see where it would lead me, and I was shocked that it was so quick. So quick. Hmm. Um, it means effectively that the planet will have changed out of all recognition in my lifetime, which is, you know, a, a blink of the eye in geological terms. But I, I should stress that this is not, this is not a scientific um, paper. It's not been published in any respectable journal. It's just me scribbling on the back of an envelope with some numbers. <laughs> now, I'd, I'd really like some climate scientists to turn up on the blog and tell me that I'm a fool and an idiot and I'm wrong. Um, none of them have yet. But I'm sure if there was one out there, then they will eventually do that, Gareth. <laughs> I'm sure they will. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, now would be a good time to bring in Kevin Cudby. He's the author of a brand new book called From Smoke to Mirrors, How New Zealand Can Replace Fossil Fuel, uh, Liquid Fossil Fuels and Locally Made Renewable Energy by 2040. There's also a review of this book up at hottopic.co.nz. But uh, Kevin's joining us on the line now. G'day there, Kevin. Yeah, hi, Gareth. Hi, hi there, Kevin. Kevin. Now, um, w- would you say that, um, that this book was, was 30 years in the making? 30 years, no, it was about three years in the making, but uh, it's it talks about uh, a lot of technologies that uh, people have known about for, uh, in some cases, 100 years. Um, the best solution's been 30 years in the making, and put it that way. Okay, um, and since, would you say that since the, the last big oil shock in the 70s? Absolutely, mm. yeah. I, I mean, I, I interviewed a lot of people um, in New Zealand around the world, and... Um, a lot of them have been working on solutions since then. Yeah. Um, you know, they, although um, a lot there was a lot of uh, a lot less interest when oil price oil prices stabilised, um, they didn't stop working on solutions. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to change from being able to drill a hole in the ground and get oil out and put it into the um, pumps within a few months. Uh, we, we're not going to be able to do that sort of quick response anymore. Mm. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about fossil fuels or climate neutral fuels um, we have the same problem uh, so you know the, the the solutions that I talk about in my book obviously they're climate neutral because mm. um, I, I want um, New Zealand to uh, to actually eliminate um, greenhouse gas emissions from um, from all our liquid fuel applications and uh, and we can do that but um, the book has a plan um, which runs for more than 25 years mm. you know and it's in the title in the subtitle i said we can do it by 2040 but we need to start planning for it now um, and we need to build we need to build energy facilities factories to make this stuff and these factories take six years to build mm. typically so you you can't just click your fingers and, and watch it happen what you know? uh, what alternatives are we talking about here uh well what what we have to do is make a flexible plan because when you look out over 25 years, um, you know things can change. Someone might make a breakthrough in some technology that at the moment we think is not very promising. So initially, what we need to do is have a look at about 40% of our liquid fuels. This is the the, the jet fuel, the diesel, and the fuel oil that are used in applications where. Um, the alternatives that, that some people are talking about, like batteries or hydrogen and things like that, don't work. You know, um, a battery-powered uh, ditch digger, it just <laughs> completely <laughs> impractical. Yeah. Um, that's 40% of our fossil liquid fuels. Um, it's quite a big percentage of the diesel, and, um, and of course, it's all the jet fuel, um, because uh, it's very hard to make aeroplanes, you know, airliners that... Um, they run on anything but kerosene. Yeah. Um, so that's where that that is where I think we need to start because um, that that uh, gets us well into the middle of 2025 before we even have to think about road transport. Yeah. Because and, and so you know if road transport changes in that time, we can build that into our plans. What we know we can do here is we can produce um, we can produce either we can produce liquid fuels or we can produce hydrogen, or we can produce electricity, and we can make that out of, out of um, sustainable forests. Okay. Um, and, and, and what we're also learning is that we get a lot of environmental side benefits by doing that, by converting very low productivity land that's currently used for things like grazing sheep and, and stuff like that. Uh, if we convert that to forests, we create a lot of habitat for things like falcons, for example. Falcons like areas where trees have just been harvested, but they don't like um, hills covered in grass. So we can create a lot of opportunities for them. But at the same time, um, we can we can keep our economy ticking over. Um, Kevin, I know there's been a, a trial scheme um, up, up around Rotorua, I think, using... Uh, willow or salix species. Can you right. tell us what's happening there? That that is, um, they call that short rotation forestry, um, 
that is actually a form of agricultural uh, biomass production. What you do, you need relatively flat land to do it uh, because the, the what you do is you plant the willows and then um, after a year or two you, you, you shear them off at ground level and they regrow from the stumps. Um, and uh, you can do this yourself. If you've got a, a willow tree in your backyard and you cut it down and then you come back a few months later, you'll find it's, it's growing from the stump. Um, and so you can do that several times. Um, <clears throat> but um, that suffers, that's really in the class of agricultural biofuels. And the problem you have there is people have to put in uh, fertilizer. Um, for example, most of the nutrients in a tree are in the leaves and the bark. So when you when you mow down these these short rotation forests, the whole lot goes into the harvesting and into the biofuel production, and uh, that means you're taking away all the nutrients. Okay. Whereas what our what our radiata pine forest um, foresters do, um, they leave the leaves on the ground and they leave a whole lot of twigs and things. Mm. And by doing that. Um, they've accidentally in invented a way of just leaving all the nutrients in the forest, or almost all of them, and um, so it's quite different. The short rotation forestry, you, you might as well, say, grow corn and turn it into ethanol. It's the same kind of pro process. Um, it's okay. quite different. Are there any native trees that might be suitable? I'm just thinking that you would have a huge win-win if you could somehow find native tree species because then you'd be able to say that you were kind of reforesting the original um, ecosystem. Well, I think there probably are, but I, I, you know, we haven't got to the point of, of studying them yet um, to find out. Um, uh, a, lot of our, a lot of the forest trees that... that we used for timber in the early days in New Zealand um, probably wouldn't work the same way that radiata pine works because they like to grow under a canopy of mature trees and um, so that's different to what we do with radiata is we clear fell and we do that for safety reasons for example and then we plant the trees right in the open and they just grow from there without any um, without any other shelter um, so there are probably some native forest edge species um, that might adapt to the same kind of management mm. uh, but I you know I've, I've worked with some people who, who sort of have studied this and I've spoken to a lot of foresters and, and I haven't ever heard of anybody experimenting with um, with with any of the sort of species we could do that with um, I, I to be honest um, I don't know that there's that much of an advantage there's a photograph in my book of a of a radiata pine forest where I went into the forest and I just uh, happened to be going through the central North Island and I thought well I'll find if some pine trees and I'll go and take a photo to show people what the understory looks like um, because it you know 25 years um, you get an awful lot of Undergrowth compared to um, a 25-year-old native forest um, regeneration, we get hardly any um, undergrowth. You get a bit of carnuka and manuka and not much else. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, I'm not really sure whether whether um, there's a big advantage to doing native species or not. But I do think it's worth investigating and studying. Mm. Um, you know, because it, it it makes sense to use a native species if you can. Uh, Kevin, you were also talking about um, hydrogen, obviously, and we've heard about hydrogen for many years as a fuel source to power cars and that kind of thing, uh, but it's, a, it's an energy-intensive process to, to make hydrogen in the first place. So, so what's your rationale behind that? Well, every, every process is, requires energy. I mean, the thing about energy is that you don't just make it. Um, you have to transform it from something to something else. Um, and... Um, what I found was that, um, just to give you a comparison of how it works, um, if you're using biofuels, um, you start with solar energy, the trees then convert that into wood, um, and then you convert the wood into something you can use as fuel. Um, now, I calculated that to run our road transport system, or in fact, to, to replace all of our liquid fuels with, with something made from wood, that you need the same area of forest no matter whether you use battery vehicles or hydrogen or petrol and diesel. Mm. It's the same amount of forest. And so um, now, now that neglects 
a problem with batteries we have at the moment where there's a tremendous amount of energy that goes into making batteries. So that, in fact, <laughs> they, if you really want to say which is the most energy intensive, um, it, it's probably the batteries. Um, so this is where you get enthusiasts for one particular technology criticising another one, um, and when you stand back and actually look at the whole broad picture, you find that, well, mm. really, uh, what matters is which is the most practical. Right now, um, the hydrogen vehicles are actually looking very, very promising, but uh, my analysis shows we probably don't need them. We're probably just as well off with petrol and diesel, to be honest. Huh. Um, so there you go, you know, and, um, and of course the other thing is that by about 2020, um, you know, some people say, oh, well, okay, you know, hydrogen is, is um, it doesn't have exhaust emissions, uh, but um, the exhaust treatment and the, and the, um, the new fuel injection system things that, and the things that we're seeing uh, being developed at the moment um, are getting so good that actually the primary source of pollution by the 2020s um, should be uh, from the tyre treads wearing off onto the road. Wow. <laughs> so, of course, <laughs> it doesn't matter what the vehicle runs on. We're going to be more concerned about treating the water, you know, the rainwater running off our roads to get that stuff out of there before mm. we release that back into the into the environment. You know, mm. whereas at the moment, we're more concerned about what's going up into the air, um, particularly from, uh, for example, cheap second-hand diesel vehicles, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so um, you, you really must take a broad view, um, you know, and, and look at all the technologies and, and just try and get a handle on where they're going. Now, I'll, I'll just, um, if I could chop in there, now, I, to, when you say the broad view, I mean, one thing that we do know about politics, and a lot of this will come down to politics, unfortunately, exactly. um, is that they don't take the broad view, and... Um, it's whatever happens first will be um, will determine what the reaction is. So, so if it's the um, if it's the uh, fuel squeeze that happens first, then then the government will react to that. But if it's the climate squeeze that happens first, then they'll react to that. So, no, I just figured that if if the fuel squeeze happens before the the climate squeeze, so to speak, then won't won't they just turn around and start using coal because we've got oodles amount of coal in the in the South Island. Well, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's not a matter of a, a climate squeeze. We've known about climate change. Uh, we've known about the possibility uh, of, of uh, human activity affecting the climate since the 50s. Um, and I've, I documented some, a few just key points from, from old um, books and, and records in the first chapter of my book. Um, by about the 1970s, people were starting to actually worry about it. You know, they were starting to say, look, you know, there's going to be so much carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere uh, that we're going to overheat the planet. Um, and that that's a fact. Um, and I, I, I quoted from uh, James Hansen because I liked his way of, of analysing it. He, he won't, he, his method won't tell us whether New Zealand's going to be better off in the future as, you know, as it's affected by global warming or worse off. But what he can tell us is overall how it's going to affect the planet mm. without reference to any of these climate models. Um, and uh, that really is the fundamental um, fact that we're dealing with. There's enough fossil resources uh, to, to produce many times more petrol and diesel than we've used throughout the world so far. Mm. We know that. Um, and we know how to convert all of those fossil fuels, so all those fossil resources, into petrol and diesel. We know that. Um, if we keep doing that, we've got two problems. Firstly, we have to make factories to convert those fossil fuels, those fossil resources, into petrol and diesel. And that can take five years to build one factory, and we're going to need a lot of them. And the second thing, of course, is that the more of those factories we build, the more the um, greenhouse emissions go up. And we're just talking about, you drive your car down to the dairy today, and you can work out how much carbon dioxide emission came out of your car by doing that. In 20 years' time, if we're using uh, petrol and diesel made out of coal or uh, oil shale or something like that, then the total... Um, greenhouse emissions from driving down to the shop are going to be way worse than they are today. Mm. And um, so 
it has a snowballing effect. Um, and, and actually, it doesn't matter whether they develop fossil resources or uh, climate neutral resources. Um, we're still going to face a whole lot of potential supply crunches. The only problem, the only real question, is when is that going to happen? Is it going to happen in this decade, or is it going to happen in the 2020s? Mm. Uh, Do you take a view on that in the book, Kevin? Um, not. I haven't tried to, you know, put my oar into predicting when it's going to happen, because there's a lot of people doing that. I mean, this is the peak oil problem that you get a lot of books about. Um, what I will say is that it plays into the hands of the oil companies because every time there's a supply crunch, that cranks up the price of petrol and diesel. Um, and if they time it right and they start building a factory, by the time they're finished, the profitability of it's improved dramatically over what, what it would have been when they started. So um, they have no incentive uh, to prevent this happening. In fact, uh, they get rewarded for delaying building the factories as long as possible. And um, so, yeah, we do need political leadership. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, we're just we're just going to be at the mercy of these um, multinational energy companies. One of the key things, Kevin, is is obviously the price of the fuel that can be generated by these processes. Have you got an idea of how they might compare? Well, I've costed all the fuels. Um, you know, all the all the methods we, that we could use in New Zealand for making hydrogen, um, all the methods that we can use for producing synthetic petrol and diesel, um, ethanol, all of those, they were all costed in the book. Uh, and the, and the, the, the interesting thing is that um, we've got a lot of really good technological options that, that indicate that, um, you know, the, the, the cost of fuel will go up. We can be sure about that. And it doesn't actually matter whether it's fossil um, fuel, whether it comes from fossil resources or climate neutral. Uh, but what will improve quicker, I think, is the efficiency of vehicles so that um, although you're paying more per litre, you're buying less fuel by 2040. And um, so people should not be afraid that their cars are going to cost a fortune to run because that's not going to happen. More importantly, of course, um, our transportation system uh, won't cost more to run. Um, you know, we can reduce transport costs, for example, by transport, transferring freight from, from trucks to trains, but we can also reduce the cost of running the trucks. So, you know, when you get when you get to a certain point, you want to take freight off a train and put it on a truck. Even though the diesel to run that truck is going to cost a bit more in 2040, the truck itself will need less fuel. So, um, so, so we shouldn't be afraid that uh, all of a sudden, you know, it's going to come become too expensive um, to live in New Zealand, uh, because I, I don't really think that's a factor at all. Mm. Okay, honest. so if you were if you were Jerry Brownlee for a day, <laughs> which you probably don't want to be, um, what would what would you be starting on now? Where would you be going first? I, I'd be looking. I'd be looking for a um, a multi. Yeah, well, a bipartisan approach initially. If if we can, if we, if we can get um, our key political leaders to say, look, you know, let's let's do this. You know, we, we can argue, they, they can argue about, you know, if they represent the left wing or the right wing, they they can argue about the details. But um, you know, at some point, John Key, just after he was elected, came around and said, climate change is real, and we've got to do something about it. Mm. Now, we need them all to, to accept that as a fact. And the other thing that um, we need to do, you know, there's, there's, there's enough economic evidence out there now to suggest that uh, we're not going to make this change unless we ban fossil fuels. And that's why I, I picked up on um, uh, Dr. Crum got, Crumdike's um, idea of a sinking lid on our liquid fuel um, imports so that over time, we reduce the amount of liquid fuel that's allowed to be imported into New Zealand until it's completely banned. Hmm. And, and, and we can do that, um, and then that way we can, we can make the change. Well, I think, I think on that note, uh, banning fossil fuels, I think that's a good point to leave you, Kevin. Um, but that's such a, that's a, that would be a, a quite an amazing uh, move um, in the future if that was to, was to happen. Um, your book, From Smoke to Mirrors, 
is out now, how New Zealand can replace fossil fuel, uh, fossil liquid fuels with locally made renewable energy by 2040. There's the website as well from smoketomirrors.com. Hey, Kevin, thanks for around joining us on The Climate Show. That's no problem. Thank you. Great. Yeah, and, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Okay. Really and, interesting to talk. Yeah, and hopefully we can, yeah. uh, we can get you back on as well. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Cheers, Kevin. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye. It, it's interesting. I, 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 sometimes, you know, you sit in your little farm blogging away on climate. Um, you know, you, you, sometimes it's really good to realise that there are lots of other people around the country who are thinking the same way who are who are arriving at similar sorts of answers by different routes yeah which is which is encouraging it's a bit like the evidence that climate change is real you know what we've got is a huge stack of evidence that that, that points all in the same direction and yeah I, I really think it's cool that that happens with solutions too and i feel we only kind of um flew across the surface of uh, some of the content of of that book as well so um, I'm, I'm quite keen to to pick it up and have a good good wee look through from smoke to mirrors. Let's Excellent. yeah, let's move on to um, our our next feature. Um, it's kind of an introduction to this feature: debunking the skeptic. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's one of the things that uh, I when I first set up Hot Topic, when I wrote the book, and when I set up the, the the website, I wanted to be able to answer people's questions about skeptics because very often. Um, skeptics will get themselves into the media, whether it be radio or TV or writing op-eds for the Herald or the Don Post or the press, um, and they say things and they assert things about climate change that simply aren't true. And they have a whole repertoire of, of standard arguments that, um, that have been debunked many, many times over, but they seem to feel free to you know, repeat them ad infinitum. So I thought it was an important part of what I wanted to do with the book and the blog was to call people out when I thought that they were talking nonsense. And so, um, yeah, this section of the show, really what we want to do, and I hope it'll develop this way as we go on, is just to look at some of the key arguments, come up with some of the um, the, 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 the key answers to those things so that uh, we can deal with uh, the sorts of stuff that you might get sort of said by Rodney Hyde in Parliament or uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, James Inhofe in, in the Senate in, um, in the US. Yeah, some of those are favourites. And, and a lot of this is also discussed, um, uh, there's a great website, scepticalscience.com. Yeah, that, Skeptical Science, absolutely fantastic website, being put together by an Australian called John Cook. And it's basically um, debunks all of the standard climate denier um, arguments and he has a kind of top 20 of them um, they're debunked in the easy way uh, there's the scientific level you know for, for people who've got postgraduate degrees and there's even a Twitter level um, <laughs> debunking and what I love because because I'm a bit of a gadget freak um, there's an iPhone app you know which um, you can it's got all the skeptical science info in there and it's on your iPhone you can carry it around also available I think for Nokia and uh, Android smartphones oh, cool. so yeah really fantastic and I, I'm hoping that um, we'll be able to hook up with skeptical science and and see where see, see see if we can tap into some of the expertise that they've got on offer yeah I like the um, the most used uh, skeptical arguments um, sort of barometer there um, it's the sun, Bing. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the sun. It's always the sun. <laughs> I suppose the sun's a component. You can't completely... Um, oh, well, if the, sun, if the sun didn't exist, you know, we wouldn't be here. So, yeah, well, that's yeah. right. That's very true. Well, um, let's move on to, uh, finally, our final segment, uh, the solutions, the many-part solutions, I think, as you called it, Gareth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are loads and loads and loads of things. See, there's, there is no magic silver bullet Um that's a solution to climate change. Um, what we've got is is a sort of multiple crunch that needs to be addressed. And uh, yeah, something Kevin was saying when he was talking about you know getting rid of uh, fossil fuels, uh, liquid fuels in New Zealand. There are lots of different approaches, and we've probably got to use um, lots of those approaches. You can't just pick on one and hope it's going to solve the problem. Mm. So the many parts solution is is uh, it's a, if you like it's our eco geek section. Um, yeah, where we, where we can look at the really interesting technologies and really interesting approaches to doing things that will help address the climate problem. Hopefully, they'll also address all the other things as well, like peak oil and 
uh, the other things that are the resource crunch that, that 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 we're going to face in the coming decades. Yeah, and I think we should mention um, this uh, piece that was on New Scientist over the past week or so um, about uh, uh, they're calling it Sunrise Boulevards could bring clean power. They're talking about PV cells. Um, yeah, that's that's yeah. right. I thought that was a really interesting piece because what they're talking about is using. Um, what you might think of as dead space it's the road surface basically so you could be driving along a road but the road itself is coated in uh, photovoltaic cells so cells that take the solar energy that's falling on them and turn it into electricity store it and then feed it into the grid for people to use so i mean i thought that was interesting i mean there are lots of difficulties associated with that who knows how much it's going to cost to hmm. you know set up a solar highway um but, you know, it, there's a lot of that sort of innovative thinking going on. And I happen to think that what's called the uh, solar photovoltaic um, technologies have the potential to be a real game changer in the way that we uh, approach our energy use. Um, there's some very interesting numbers around, like um, on my little house in, in Wipera here, um, enough sunlight falls on the roof every year to power my energy requirements many many times over yeah so if we could come up with a technology that allows um my my roof to harvest that power cost effectively um i could be running apart from running my um laptop and lighting and um the the uh, you know the kitchen and stuff maybe i could also be fueling my own car so I could drive into Christchurch uh, with power that I've I've generated myself. And what's really interesting is another item that we picked up on uh, from the Climate Progress blog. They were looking at um, a Swiss company called Erlikon, um, who I thought they made gun. Apparently, have developed a means of producing a non-silicon thin film photovoltaic generator for about I think it's 50 euro cents per watt which is well below the one dollar a watt price barrier that got broken last year by a US company called First Solar so what you're getting down to when you're getting down to these sorts of prices and you're beginning to get these sorts of technologies mm. it's mean solar cells used to be really expensive things there was a lot of capital required up front um, before you could um, before you could put these things on your roof and it would take a long time to get the money back the capital that you've employed in terms of the energy you generate so you know you were looking at maybe 10 or 15 years uh, to get that money back uh, but the price of the the, these these technologies is coming down and getting lower and getting lower. And and, and what is that? What is that driven by? Is that driven by um, by demand and therefore mass producing it brings the cost down, or is it the actual technology itself is becoming cheaper? Well, it's two. It's actually three things. The first thing is that there's a bunch of very smart people in the U.S. who've decided that this is the going to be the next big thing, and so they have been funding. Um, research in this field and funding the next stage beyond the research which is you know how do we do this on a factory scale and so there are lots silicon valley actually <laughs> you know, which which kind of invented the computer business they're working very hard on these sorts of renewable technologies as well and so that's one aspect that there's been a lot of money going into the research and development side of things uh, from entrepreneurs. The second thing is that yes it is about factory scale production so a lot of the technologies that they've been looking at have been devoted not necessarily to making the cells more efficient uh, that is harvesting more of the sunlight per unit area but by making them cheaper mm. so they're, they're developing systems that can actually um, you know s spray paint them on uh, to surfaces or which can be where you could use something like an inkjet printer or if you think of a, the, the sort of printing machines they use to print newspapers and books, um, to have that sort of machine that would print you like a giant long roll of solar photovoltaic material. Right. So you could then hang on the side of a house or, you know, stick on a roof or whatever. Um, and so although they may not be terribly efficient as, 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 as solar cells go, the fact that they're so cheap and so readily available means that you could cover more area, get the same thing for less cost. 
And then you've got the third thing, which is that there's some really exciting new technology coming along. And that is that not only are they being able to make these things so that you could perhaps have a solar paint that you put on your roof, which generates electricity, but that they're, they're looking at things like reverse engineering photosynthesis. So the system that plants use to capture energy from the sun, um, they're looking at nanotechnology techniques that, that can mimic that. And so I'm pretty confident that sometime over the next 5, 10, 15 years, there's going to be some fairly major breakthroughs in these areas. And that what that means is that for a country like New Zealand, we have plenty of sunshine. Uh, we're not like sort of Iceland or Norway, yeah. you know. We've got we're, we're we're quite close to the equator in those terms. We could, as I said, with my roof, I could I could have solar photovoltaics on my roof during the day. My meter would be spinning backwards because I'd be feeding power into the grid, um, and the hydro dams could turn off for a little while because you know it's daytime and all these roofs are producing electricity. And then at night, when I'm not generating anything, then the hydro dams can turn back on and acting. They, so the dams begin to act like the batteries of the system. I mean, one of the problems in New Zealand at the moment is, yes, I could put a solar cell on my roof. Yes, I could plug it into the grid, but the electricity company would only pay me the wholesale rate. They wouldn't even pay me the same rate that they charge me for, for electricity from the grid. Mm. So even if we could get grid parity um, or a feed-in tariff, I think I think the Green Party has argued for feed-in tariffs in the past, those sorts of things would help the adoption um, of these technologies um, much more quickly, and I, I think I'm I'm pretty certain that you know th these are clever solutions. That they're, they're not they're not um, relying on um, people being altruistic. You can actually you know these are solutions that where people can save themselves money as well as help to generate renewable electricity. Mm. Cool, and so that's um so that's a wee look at one of the many part solutions we'll have. Um, all kinds of um, solutions, I guess, through future shows as well, and maybe even revisit PV cells as well. Gareth, I think that's been a show. Yeah, I think it has, Glenn. It's um, it's gone quite well. Fifty minutes or whatever seems <laughs> to have whizzed by. So uh, yeah. yeah, looking forward to doing it again. Um, that's that's the climate show beta version. Um, uh, you can find the show and more links and more discussion over at hot-topic.co.nz. That's where you'll find Gareth hanging out. Also on Twitter as well, twitter.com forward slash. What's your Twitter handle, Gareth? Uh, Hot Topic NZ. Hot Topic NZ. And uh, me, I'm over at uh, twitter.com forward slash radio whammo or whammo.co.nz as well. As, as I say, we hope to um, roll this show out and um, have many more episodes into the future and uh, more guests and great content as well. Um, keen to get your feedback. Either you can give us the feedback on um, on YouTube and the YouTube channel there, as I say, over at hot-topic.co.nz. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, Glenn. Be a pleasure. What good is a drop in the ocean? What good is a drop in the ocean?